praise and rejoicing. Let all God's creatures sing praise and joy. Open your hearts and spirits today. Let us praise the Lord today and always. Amen. Our opening hymn is Joyful, Joyful. Back to what we just played. Uh, we adore the, uh, it's found in your United Methodist hymnal, page 89. Young men, young women too. 
you who are old together with you who are young. Let all of these praise the Lord's name, because only God's name is high over all. Only God's majesty is over heaven and earth. God raised the strength of his people, the praise of all his faithful ones. That's the Israelites, the people who are close to him. <coughs> praise the Lord.
We ask that you give us the peace and the comfort that we know that you long for us to celebrate and to enjoy. Lord, bless our country. Watch over those that are in need. Watch over those that are hurting. Watch over those that you know only what you know and they need you. Thank you for everything that you've given to us. We have so many blessings and we forget about them many times every day. Thank you for all that you've given to us. And Father, we just ask this morning that you take the heaviness that's on our hearts, those things that have burdened us, the pains that we share, the concerns that overwhelm us, Lord, and we just ask that you lift them from us. We ask that you take them up and to give us the peace of knowing that you are with us. No matter where we are traveling or where we go, you are with us. Lord, you know the hurts of all the people, not only with us, but throughout the world. There's so many hurts. We ask the question, why? Why does this happen? Why is this, why do bad things happen? You know the answer, it's not bad things, but to us they are. In your wisdom, you know exactly what, exactly what the path is for everybody. Keep us on that path. <laughs> May we always pray for peace everywhere, not only in our families, in our, in our hearts, but all over the world. Today's scripture is about walking to Emmaus. Now, just think about this, walking. What do you think the people of Jesus' time walked with? What was on their feet? Think about it. High tops? No, not so much. Think about it. Well, they actually wore something probably similar to this sandals. And we also talk a lot about when they were going to people's homes, that people would wash their feet from the dusty road, right? So today, two friends were walking on the road to Emmaus, a long way, in sandals, kind of tough on your feet, right? Tough on your body. Yeah. So they were talking, and they were talking about how sad they were that Jesus had died. And they were just very, very sad. And they were talking about Jesus. And a man came up to him. And they said, what is it you were talking about? And do you know what? He didn't know what had happened. And the people were 
were so surprised. He said, how could you not know about the death of Jesus? So they walk with him for a little bit, and then they walk some more, and then they invited him to dinner. And do you know what happened at dinner? They found out it was really Jesus that had been resurrected and had come back. And do you know what? They didn't recognize him. They did not recognize him. So, I want to talk to you a little bit about disguises. Have you ever worn a Halloween costume where someone couldn't see your face? And what do you do? You know that disguise, right? So I brought a few props to help us with disguises. You ready? You can hold the mic for me. All right. So this is my Dr. Seuss hat from preschool. Thing one and thing two. All right. Now. It's about the encounter on the Emmaus Road. 
On that same day, two disciples were traveling to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking to each other about everything that had happened. While they were discussing these things, Jesus himself arrived and joined them on their journey. They were prevented from recognizing him. He said to them, Why are you talking, what are you talking about as you walk along? They stopped their faces, downcast. The one named Cleopas replied, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who is unaware of the things that have taken place there over the last few days? He said to them, What things? They said to him, The things about Jesus of Nazareth. Because of his powerful deeds and words, he was recognized by God and all the people as a prophet. But our chief priests and our leaders handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped he was the one who would redeem Israel. All these things happened three days ago, but there's more. Some women from our group have left us stunned. They went to the tomb early this morning and didn't find his body. They came to us saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who told them he's alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found things just as the women said. They didn't see him. Then Jesus said to them, You foolish people, your dull minds keep you from believing all the prophets talked about. May God add his blessings to our words. Please join in our next hymn. Emmaus found on Easter Day. The words are found in your bulletin. <laughs>
Heavenly Father, Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pure and acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So my wife, Jenny, and many of my close friends will tell you that I have a love for classic country music. So much, in fact, that a couple of weeks ago, um, when we were down in Roanoke visiting some family, I insisted that we make a pilgrimage to the small town of Galax, just south of Roanoke, so that I could see a town that I had come to dearly know through my many, many hours of streaming classic country WBRF 98.1 <laughs> FM online while working. Now, as we were coming into town, I started pointing out all the restaurants, the businesses, and the beloved Maurice Vaughn furniture store sitting high on the mountain that I heard all the commercials for. And yes, I made sure that to drive past the radio station itself. But when you listen to this expansive music genre's catalog, you will find that roads and highways are a common theme throughout. You have John Denver's Take Me Home Country Roads, King of the Road by Roger Miller, you have Convoy by C.W. McCall, Eastbound and Down by Jerry Reed, Heads Carolina Tales California by Jody Messina, and On the Road Again by Willie Nelson, just to name a few. <coughs> now, much in the same way that country music has its roots in gospel music and the songs of the church, the use of imagery and roads and the importance that they play have the same foundations for our faith. Now, there are numerous stories of people along the roadside approaching Jesus as he passed and asking him to heal them. We know of people laying palm branches and their cloaks on the road as Jesus made his entry into Jerusalem. And then in Acts, we hear about Saul falling to the ground and being blinded while he was traveling on the road to Damascus, where he had intended to lead the persecution of Christians. Now, when we talk about roads during this biblical time, we can actually draw some comparisons to the actual types of roads that we think of today. Thanks to the engineering feats and the knowledge of the Romans, roads that were heavily traveled and important for the movement of goods and also for military troops and support of the empire were in relatively good shape. They were wide and had a surface made up of smooth paving stones. They were essentially the highways of the day. But many of the smaller roads between villages were simply dirt pathways. They were crudely marked, rutted, and muddy. If you walked or biked along the Zeno Canal towpath recently, before the park service had resurfaced it, I think that paints a really good picture of what these roads were like. I can remember one summer several years ago when we had a church bike ride from Brunswick up to Harper's Ferry and back. And since it had just rained the night before, when we all got back to our cars, everyone and their bikes were caked in mud. Nor, if you've ever headed up Paul Bottom Road, where I live, and you go towards the top of the mountain, past where the county maintenance ends, you go very quickly from it being a paved road to a barely discernible pathway. And now the first time that we drove my Jeep up there, I remember asking Jenny, is this still a road or are we in some clearing in the trees? And there were puddles of unknown depth and ruts that I didn't know if my, believe it or not, two-wheel drive Grand Cherokee would make it through and rocks that I could constantly hear scraping on the oil pan. Yet with faith and perseverance, we got to the other end of the road, where it meets up with Coxie Brown Road, and on through to Gamble Park. So now, in these biblical times, if you wanted to get from point A to point B, you had to travel the road that was there, no matter how long, how twisty, or how impassable. You couldn't simply say, oh, well, we'll just take the other way into town. If all you had was a narrow mountain path strewn through the boulders, you simply couldn't turn around and take the bypass. The point here is that you were given the road you had to travel, and you're going to have to make the best of the situation and get through to your destination, no matter what. Now this brings us to today's scripture. Here we have Cleopas and a companion making their way out of Jerusalem. The Passover had concluded, Jesus had been crucified, buried, and now the tomb was empty. 
But to them, they simply saw it as Jesus was no longer with them. Everything that they had hoped for, that Jesus was going to be the Savior of Israel, that there would be a new Earl order, to them it was all done and over with. And so now they are traveling to a small village outside Jerusalem called Emmaus. But why Emmaus? There are some biblical scholars who have surmised that this other disciple that's not named was in fact believed as his wife, Mary, who was one of the women to stand by the cross. So maybe they were just heading home. But since we don't have definitive conclusions, you know, maybe these two travelers had friends or family that they wanted or needed to see. Maybe there was a really good restaurant there that they always wanted to try but never had the chance to. Perhaps it was just someplace they felt that they could go and get away from their sorrows and the pressures of the big city. And we know that this endpoint was about seven miles west of Jerusalem, and so we can figure that they had left in the morning if they were reaching Emmaus about evening. Now travel at night was definitely not advised because not only were the road conditions and dangers hidden by darkness, but very easily thieves could be lurking in the shadows ready to pounce. So then maybe a maze was just going to be a stopover for the night in preparation for another journey the following morning. And these disciples were simply traveling and just knew the path that they were going to take. They had no idea why ahead on their journey to their destination. Now someone who was born in the 1980s there was one thing that we all looked forward to when I was in elementary school at Carroll Manor, and that was when the lab instructor in the computer lab broke out the disc for us to play the Oregon Trail. Now, you never knew when someone was going to get bitten by a snake, or when a wagon tongue would break, or if the spot that you stopped to hunt at was only filled with a few squirrels and no bears. It took faith in knowing you picked the right time to leave Independence, Missouri, had kept enough cash to buy supplies at Fort Laramie, and could work the left and right arrow keys when rafting down the Columbia River to get you and your party safely to the Willamette Valley in Oregon. These disciples who are walking had just had their hopes smashed. Their foundations crumbled, and they know not what waited ahead on them on the road. Imagine seeing that empty tomb, and then thinking any minute they would see him risen in glory and power because of what the women had told them in the morning. Think of it like the end of a firework show. You know there's going to be a grand finale. And so based on how long the show's been going on for, you start to wonder if that very next set of mortars going up is going to be the start of the beautiful and extensive display. But sometimes there's a long pause. And then it starts after you begin to think nothing more is going to happen. That pause here was longer than the disciples had wanted. So instead of continuing to stand around this empty grave, they depart. To them, there wasn't much to be accomplished now. They were told Jesus was alive, but they were essentially saying, okay, now what? So they depart for Emmaus, clinging to the faith that God has still not abandoned his children, and that Jesus would be with them again. And it's because of this need of us leading to take a leap of faith that I dare say the invention of GPS has somewhat ruined the thrill of the road trip. Before Garmin or Google Maps was a standard in our vehicles, printing off directions from MapQuest or the road map in the glove box or maybe the atlas that lay under the seat was how we planned our course of travel. But nowadays, Siri is right there with us to let us know if there's a slowdown ahead or if there is radar set up and if things are getting really bad, She's right there to offer up an alternate route to get us to our destination. And if there's one thing that really annoys me, it's when she constantly tries to get us back on her predetermined path. I may know where I want to go, but if I want to avoid a certain way, either because I've been that way plenty of times before, or I just want to take a way that is more scenic, why won't she just listen and follow along? Now eventually she'll give up and decide that it's not worth the struggle of going back to where our perceptions deviated. But instead she'll alter her directions to get us back on course. But friends, isn't that how we are when we try and decide what paths we should be taking with our lives? Do we not think that we know best even if important details are laid out before us in black and white? 
Brothers and sisters, this morning we all need to revisit the GPS, the gospel positioning system. We may know about God and how he sent his son to die for our sins. We may know about the salvation that comes from Jesus' victory on the cross. We may think we know what God wants from us in our lives. But just like those disciples on the road, do we really know? It was God's desire for these disciples to meet up with Jesus on this particular day, on this particular road, at a particular time. Now these disciples could have simply gone north or south via another road, and Jesus would have been there instead. The disciples could have decided to treat this as a marathon and run all the way to Emmaus, and Jesus would have been there with water in hand to offer them. On the song Reckless Love by Corey Asbury, there's a chorus that states simply, there's no shadow you won't light up, mountain you won't climb up, coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down, no lie you won't tear down, coming after me. And that is true about the roads we are on and the decisions that we make. God is there to guide us, and when we decide to veer off course, which we are very prone to do, he is there doing everything in his almighty power to get us back on track. He gives us warning signs and puts people along the way to help guide and assist. But we have to have a keen eye and ever be removing those things that are blinding us from truly seeing. Now these disciples could see Jesus. And just because they saw the empty tomb not long ago that same day, it doesn't mean they could see who he was. They couldn't see what was being done in a new way. And that's why Jesus was there again to meet them. So now, let's talk more about Jesus and his travel with Cleopas and his companion. Now, how many times have you been engrossed in deep thought or in conversation with another person? You know, like in the, gold, the golden days when co-workers could actually gather around this thing called a water cooler or a coffee maker? But then someone else comes along to either interject themselves into the conversation or stands there until they acknowledge it. We've all been there. And how do we respond? Sometimes it's an open invitation. Other times it's a dismissive word or a gesture, or simply continued ignorance of their presence. So here are these two disciples being approached by someone that they don't recognize. And knowing they could be putting themselves in danger, they strike up conversation with the stranger. There was nowhere else to turn. This was the way to Emmaus. But something was being stirred inside of them, and that is what led them to be open to his companionship. Now, Sandy Blanzek, an instructor at the St. John Vianney Seminary, says, As we're repeatedly told in the Gospels, we need the eyes to see and the ears to hear. The phrase is speaking of the necessity of faith in order to recognize the truth. In leaving the church, they no longer had the faith necessary to see Jesus. She also says that Christ's resurrected, glorified body, while still his earthly body, is very different. In 1 Corinthians, Paul explains that the earthly body is to the resurrected body as a seed is to a tree. The resurrected body is clothed with power, glory, and immortality. And Jesus' resurrected body is not like the frail, mutilated one that just hung on the cross a few short days ago. They must have seen his wounds, but they couldn't grasp it with their eyes. And the telling of his appearance here he doesn't look like a ghost, as the eleven disciples thought him to be later. To them, this was simply another traveler on the road. Someone they felt comfortable striking a conversation with and not shying away from. But imagine their shock when this man seems completely ignorant of the events that had occurred in Jerusalem. What we don't know from this story is how far along on the journey they were that Jesus had connected with. But surely news of his trial and crucifixion would have spread to all the neighboring villages in only a few short days. Anyone remember that old Fabergé shampoo commercial and they told two friends and they told two friends and so on and so on? As crowds would have dispersed from Jerusalem, surely news spread like wildfire. And all of this was happening without the use of social media. Now after telling this stranger what they had experienced, what they had seen and what pain they had endured. Take note that Jesus' presence is not immediately revealed to them. 
At the tomb earlier that day when Mary sees Jesus in the garden, all it took was Jesus calling her name for her eyes to be opened. Yet after sharing their story, the disciples are not given any words of comfort. They're almost scolded with Jesus telling them, Oh, how foolish you are, and how slow of heart to believe all the prophets have declared. Now imagine what your reaction to this may have been. Do you take this as being some religious zealot that you may not want to try and you're going to ditch him as soon as possible? Or do you listen on like the disciples do? And then the stranger to them tells them what is actually his own story. Starting with Moses and then speaking of what the prophets foretold, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures about the Messiah and what he must endure. And we know this isn't the first time, the second time, the third time, or the last time. That Jesus has had to tell this to his disciples. Even after everything that they had seen, and it being the same way that Jesus told them it must be, they just couldn't make that connection. Now, if Jesus was somebody's son and grandmother, he would be simply shaking his head and saying, My, 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 uh, bless their hearts. Now, but once again, he reminds them that everything that they had experienced was all part of the new covenant. That could only be fulfilled when God's anointed one took the yoke of God's people onto himself, would be killed by those very ones that he came to save, and upon his ascension would bring new life to the world. Even after all of this, they still aren't getting it. But we know from verse 32 that there was a something stirring in their souls. They declared to the other that their hearts had been burning while this man was talking to them and opening the scriptures to them. Again, we don't know how long this conversation went on. We don't know what other questions either of these disciples or Jesus had asked one another. All we know is that when they get to Emmaus and invite the stranger to join them for dinner. Now Jesus was ready to keep moving on into, those dark, into that very darkness. But these disciples, while hungry for food, were also hungry for the knowledge and wisdom that this man was pouring out to them. They knew that they needed more. And again, we don't know how long they were at the table, sitting and listening to what Jesus was saying. Imagine over the time on the road and what was most likely now taking place in the inn, how many prophecies he must have discussed and how fortunate this duo was to have all these dots connected. Even with all of that, it wasn't until he took the bread, in the very same way that he had done only a few nights ago, for their eyes to actually be opened. The connection between what Jesus was trying to tell them before his death was the same then as it was now, and it shall be in the future. God prevented these two disciples from recognizing Jesus because he needed them to be able to believe without seeing. There is truth in the scriptures, and with that comes having faith in the goodness of the Lord. So looking back, the story of the walk to Emmaus reminds us that the risen Lord is there to sojourn with us. Even as we are tired, are hurting, are scared, or just simply want to turn away, Christ is there walking alongside us. We know not the hour, the day, the circumstance, or the person whom he may send, but Jesus is there. We may not expect him, and we may not recognize him, but Jesus is there. I think back to the time of the Last Supper, when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples. It's like Kitty was explaining with the kids. We know that these roads were dirty and they were treacherous. So Jesus was not looking at nicely pedicured feet. They were dusty, probably bruised and bloodied. But yet here is Jesus as a servant unto us, overlooking any imperfections, blemishes, or scars and still wanting to touch us and wash away the pain and the frustration of our lives. In closing, dear friends, I ask you to think about what a maze is your destination, and what road are you taking to get there? Whatever that journey is for you, remember that like the disciples, we aren't always going to see what we should, and we won't understand what we should. Don't discount what God has done simply because we cannot explain it or understand it. These two disciples knew that something had happened, but it was the reassurance from Jesus that elevated their faith to see things as they truly were. 
But the good news is that through Christ, we are given a new perspective and the promise of life on the road eternal and the road to glory. Amen. Amen. Please stand and join in our closing hymn, How Firm a Foundation, in the United Methodist Hymnal, number 529. We'll be singing stanzas 1, 2, 4, and 5, number 529. Here now this benediction and it is a familiar one, a Gaelic blessing. May the road rise to meet you, and may the wind be always at your back. May the sunshine warm upon your face, may the rain fall soft upon your fields. And until we meet again, may God hold you in the palm of his hand.